So what we'll be talking about today is the quality control procedures that are used in GTSPP. And uh, before we get into the details, I want to tell a bit about how they, they came to be and important parts about, or an important feature of a quality control procedure. So first of all, there's no magic suite of tests that will find all the errors that will occur in data sets, in profiles, in, in our case, in profiles. There just is no, nothing that you can go to, no place you can go to and see, here's the definitive set of tests. But what we wanted to do when we were building this was to uh, bring together enough of the tests that look for particular features in a profile that result from characteristic failures that you do see in instrumentation. And so we gathered together quality control routines that currently existed in a variety of places, invented a few new ones, and then assembled it all into a manual. And that manual is available to you from the training site. Now, it's enough to, it's not enough to just have a quality control procedure. Um, my personal view is it's extremely important. If you're going to go to the trouble of doing quality control, you're hoping somebody else will use those the results and not have to do it themselves. And so it's important, extremely important, you have documentation that it describes exactly what you did. Because if you don't do that, you're guaranteed people will say, I don't know what they did. I'm not going to pay attention to any flags they put in the record. If you do have the documentation and it's readily available up on a website or something like that, they still may not listen, but some will because they'll trust what you do. They'll, they'll try it out, look and see what flags uh, uh, result from looking at certain profiles, why things failed. They may gain enough confidence in what you have done for their purposes with the data to accept the flagging scheme that you proposed saves them a lot of work, particularly if you're deal dealing in large ocean areas, long time frames, and so on. So it's really important to have that documentation available. And that was the manual that, that uh, was written about 1990, 91, something like that. It has the, uh, the suite of tests are described in um, extreme detail. In fact, there's almost some pseudocode that tells you how to write the software uh, to implement the test. And that was because we wanted to be sure that people who who were interested in those tests would implement them in, in the way that uh, was consistent with what we were doing. So that's all preface, uh, a preface to my comments that are coming so we'll talk about the various procedures, the, the individual tests that, that are executed, and, uh, and then how it's all put together into uh, some interactive software that's used, and how to look at the test results. And um, we talked a bit about that already. So by the time we get there, uh, I'll remind you, if, the, if you, or maybe you'll be way ahead and understand all that before we get there. Yeah, sure. Uh, Bob mentioned that the, that the first edition of the QC manual was done in the, early, in the early 1990s. So there's a revision for the first edition uh, is available in the, uh, on the training material. It published by UNESCO in 2011, I think, or 10. So it's updated. It's a updated version. Yeah, it's, it's Manuals and Guides material. number 22, I think. Yeah, it's part of the material. And the course material and the reference. Okay, so in the course of the looking at uh, data, looking at profiles, you will see things that in the data that you know are wrong, but you also may be able to figure out what went wrong. And this is particularly so when you're looking at uh, cruise tracks uh, where platforms have moved over the course of time. Sometimes you'll see features in there, and with a little head scratching and, and looking at it, you can figure out what went wrong. A, a prime example that I have found was I was looking at some cruise, a cruise that 
was uh, paralleling the coast of Brazil. So it was coming down from the north along the coast of Brazil and around the little bump at the end. And in that cruise track, there were loops in the track. Went like, you know, a loop the loop. And at first it was, I didn't believe that that was the true ship track. And there were some peculiar speeds that were connected to that. And as it turns out, someone on one of the watches was not setting their clock to uh, local time. They were on um, GMT or vice versa. The point was just the one person on that one watch had reset the clock. And so the time that was re being reported for those stations at night, as it turned out, were offset by six hours or five hours, whatever the time difference was. And so you got these peculiar tracks because the, the stations are sorted in time order, assuming that a ship travels sequentially in time. And so it was out of step with the, the cruise. And by figuring that out, it was e easy enough to stitch together the, what the correct time would be. And the speeds between stations were all consistent. And everything worked out fine. So in that case, we actually did change the data. And, but as I described yesterday, within the format, it's able to, we are able to mark the long, uh, the, lat long or the date and time as having been changed and record the original values back in the history group in case somebody said, oh, the change you did was wrong, I want to be able to go back to the original data. So generally we don't, we don't advise changing data. Sometimes there are occasions where it's possible to figure out what the error was and how it happened. So again, the example I gave uh, yesterday, we were getting temperatures uh, from uh, the US Navy in degrees Fahrenheit and of course we didn't realize that at first we just took the numbers as they came quickly realized that they were in Fahrenheit not centigrade and uh, or Celsius and then we we did the conversion um, the instrument that's used to make the collection also has an influence on whether you believe a feature that you see in the profile or not so it's it's useful when you're looking at the data to have in mind what kind of a, an instrument was used. So for instance, an XBT has certain kinds of modes of failure that have signatures, signature features in a profile. And as you get to work with the data and uh, get familiar with those kinds of things, they'll turn up. CTDs have different modes of failure, fewer modes I would guess, but um, but it's also important to know where you are in the oceans. So for example, XBT profiles from the region of the Kuroshio off of Japan are highly variable when you look at the profiles. Uh, th there's lots of interleaving of water and you see sort of large sort of oscillations in a profile in, in that region of the ocean. They're real, but they sure look funny on a trace. Uh, another example is off the um, south of the Mediterranean outflow. In deep, in deep water at the order of, I think it's around 1,000 meters, 1,200 meters deep, you'll see temperature inversions there because the warm, salty water, water spills out of the Mediterranean and descends to about 1,200 meters where the density matches that in the Atlantic Ocean, but it still has retained enough of a temperature difference and so you'll see a little uh, temperature increase at around that depth. That's a real feature. So you, those kinds of things have to come into play. And of course, if you're new to looking at the data, uh, or it's an ocean area that you're not familiar with, then you may see something that in normal circumstances you would flag as wrong, but in fact is, is right. We found the same thing off of, um, in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico, it was in springtime, and we were seeing surface salinities of uh, 10 parts per thousand. And we thought, that can't be right. But it was spring, and the Mississippi River was flooding, and it was dumping this freshwater layer out over top of the, uh, the Gulf. And, and the stations that we saw this at were very close, or close enough to the mouth of the Mississippi River. 
normally you wouldn't see that, but springtime and that year there was uh, extra rainfall and uh, outflow from the Mississippi. So those are all things that come into play when you're actually using the software. So let's go. Here's the list of tests. A uh, very long list. It goes to 26. Not every one of these is executed, in fact. We documented a some tests, particularly in the sections on the climatology, which is uh, these numbers uh, three. There are four of those different climatologies. Not every one is used. Uh, in fact, we execute um, uh, the Levitus monthly climatology is the one we really use. Um, the other ones, uh, the Emory Endure is quite an old one, but it was one that was available at the time. The Asheville climatology is just a surface temperature, and we didn't we use that when we're looking at surface drifter data, but uh, we don't really use it with the uh, the profile data data. And the Levitus seasonal statistics um, are good; they have more um, they go deeper in calculating the values, but of course they're seasonal values. So we tend to stick with the monthly Levitus climatology, and I think. Since we started, that, that has become more um, uh, better resolution. I think it goes deeper now than it once did. And uh, so that's the one we've cho chosen to implement. Nevertheless, the tests are listed. And um, uh, if people want to use them, they're welcome to. If they want to add to the list, they're certainly welcome to do that as long as it's properly documented and, uh, and the same sort of scheme is used. These numbers you see here in brackets at the side, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, those are essentially setting the bits in that flag field that I talked about. So 1 sets the first bit on the right-hand side. Uh, the second test, if it fails, or performed and failed, is set the second bit. Uh, 4 is the third bit, and so on. But we'll talk a bit about that later. And these are executed. Uh, well, we'll just go through those just to describe uh, how they work. They're kind of executed in two groups. The first is the uh, essentially stage one tests, and these largely have to do with uh, verifying the location and time and vessel information because so that we can get a sensible cruise track. And then after that, in fact, between stage the stage one and the subsequent stage testings, we in fact do a duplicates test using the criteria that we talked about yesterday. So 15 uh, minutes in time, five kilometers. But we do this, the stage one test first, just to make sure that the actual ship track makes sense. So the positions are sensible, the times are sensible, and we know what the ship is, or if it's a ship. Sometimes it's an aircraft, uh, sometimes it's a drifter, sometimes it's uh, an Argo float. They all have different characteristics that we try to take into account. And so then the, the second set of tests really are uh, directed at the profiles themselves. And some are for the, can be used for both the temperature and the salinity profile or other profiles. Some can only be used for a particular type of data. So uh, you see the last one here listed as number 25 is a temperature inversion test. And that, of course, is only relevant to a temperature profile. The climatology tests are run after, if you will, after the, the, the uh, profile. And then there's a waterfall test that is implemented in the US. I don't think it's implemented in Canada. And then this visual inspection is, is what's called stage five here. But in fact, the way the tests execute, uh, I'll show you later. And they, they, it's not implemented in a sequential order, as you see here. So let's look at the first one. What you see is uh, that this is, again, trying to verify the, the ship position. The display you get looks something like this. It's different for different um, um, implementations of the, the QC software, but they all are basically the same, where you have a, a map of the part of the world that the cruise is in. Uh, spots that indicate what cruise, and this is usually done ship identifier or platform identifier by platform identifier. So you carve out just those and look at those themselves. And then uh, some indicators up, this is kind of
kind of a speed plot between stations, uh, and then a list of the identifier, date and time and location here, so that you can see. And as you click on uh, location on the map, it will show you where you are in the speed chart. It will show you where are, you are in the list here. And so you can kind of poke around into the, um, into the, uh, the track and uh, verify um, what's, what, uh, what happens. And this is executed, essentially the way it executes is you go through this graphics interface and all the tests uh, are applied before you actually see it on the screen. So if there's a problem, often a station will be highlighted in a different color um, and you can, look at, you can look at why that one appears to be wrong. And the flag, the suggested flag is usually marked so in case uh, where you might see um, on a track like this you might see a big spike where a position had a 10 degree error or something in, in latitude then that would be indicated in some different color and you can, if, if it looks like it's wrong and you can't figure out why you just leave it set with a flag of 4 saying this is not a good location, and, uh, and you proceed on to the next cruise. Looking at a set of cruises like this is uh, fairly efficient. You can go through a, a fair amount of data like this in a relatively short time. So it's executed. The, the stations that have troubles are indicated on the graphical display, and you play around with um, the, the display to try to figure out what's wrong. So the first one is just looking at the identification. And in the US, uh, they have a data file that compares a set of station identifiers to what is coming in in the incoming file. Uh, in Canada, we didn't have that. Um, we just um, we did have a, a set of call signs that we knew. And when we found a call sign we didn't know, then uh, we would go and look at the ITU website, the Inter International Telecommunications Union, which is where call signs are registered. We would go there, identify, and if the call sign was there, then that's fine. We would add it to our little file that helped us check. If it wasn't there, then we would try to see if, uh, if perhaps there was an error in the call sign. In the old days, some of this I was, came ashore with people sending radio messages by hand. Mistakes often happened. Nowadays, it's uh, unusual. Although somebody may make a mistake in entering a, a call sign on the computer, and you may get a whole suite of uh, problems like that. Not so important, except that you use the platform identifier to group together the individual stations to identify a cruise and therefore a logical progression of uh, observations. So all it does is it takes, compares it and if there's something wrong uh, then you try to figure out if it's uh, an error or a new identifier that you haven't seen before. We never threw out a station just because the identifier was, was unknown if, we could, if it looked like it was odd or wrong and we could make a reasonable guess, we would guess to stitch it together into another cruise. But um, we would never throw a, a station out just because the identifier was wrong. Next thing to do, a very simple check. Make sure that the year is less than or equal to the current year. You expect it to the data to actually appear within 30 days for the real-time tests. For delayed mode, it's got to be a sensible year. It won't be uh, 1722 or something like that, and it won't be 2050. It's got to be in the, a sensible year range. The month, of course, has to be a month digit of 1 through 12. A day has to be an appropriate uh, day of the month that has been reported. Hours between 0 and 23 minutes between 0 and 59. Again, these, these kinds of errors don't happen very often, but they do. And uh, it's, it's useful just having a test. It's a, just a con to make sure that the dates and times are sensible. 
it doesn't mean they're right, but it means at least they've entered correctly in a day, a, a date and time that makes sense. Location, again, a very simple test. Make sure it's somewhere located on the Earth. Um, occasionally you'll see, uh, this is very, very seldom a test like this fails, but it happens. Sometimes you'll see stations, more typically you'll see stations where a sign is, made, is wrong. So the one I quoted yesterday about the cruise that looked like it bounced off the equator. In fact, when it had crossed the equator, so they just forgot to put a negative sign in there for the latitude. Um, sometimes also the communication system might fail and you'll get um, latitudes that are zeros. So a station is, the ship is progressing in a nice uniform track and the next thing you know it goes to zero, zero for lat and long and then comes back to its ship track. Something failed in, in setting that date and time or that position correctly and so you want to be able to flag that. Occasionally you can figure out what it should be, um, but if you can't, then that's a failure. And that station um, will get a flag of four on the Latin long. Position on land. Um, you shouldn't usually have a problem with this, but occasionally you do. And, uh, and um, so you just want to make sure that the location that is given is not only on the world, but also in the ocean. We had a problem with uh, stations being collected in our Great Lakes. And there's one place where the Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron all come together in a very small neck. And we had some data there from, the, from a, a Canadian vessel. And it was consistently telling us it was on land. But that was because the resolution of our land file wasn't good enough to distinguish the lakes from the land. So that's okay. We looked at it, we saw it was where it was, and uh, said, well, the position's okay. It's not on land. The test thought it was. We also occasionally find that in, um, in coastal stations. It's not uncommon, depending on the resolution of your, uh, your um, uh, file. So we used, uh, we used a five-minute bathymetry file because in there it also tells you whether you're on the land whether it's a, a land station or a location or not. Uh, there's a higher resolution file available now that's a two-minute bathymetry. And so you could use that too. Next thing is, is the time, is the speed traversed between stations a sensible speed for the platform? So essentially you just take the, the two locations, uh, Compute that distance through uh, a computation, you know, of Latin long differences. Calculate, use the time difference, calculate the speed between those two points. And if it's larger than one you expect for a particular platform, then, um, then uh, a red flag goes up. Um, the way the test is uh, performed, usually it's if the second station um, is too far away from the first one. That's often what the problem is. It doesn't mean the second station is wrong. It could be it's the first one. But it, it, the test failure is triggered uh, when it compares the two and it flags the second station as the one that's in trouble. Um, for different kinds of, like for ships at sea, depending on whether it's a research vessel or a commercial vessel or a naval vessel, they all have different maximum speeds. And all, all the test really does is say that for a ship, um, which can be identified by the call sign, that it's a ship as opposed to something else, you expect 50 knots is uh, certainly within the capability of all those kinds of vessels. They don't usually go that fast. But if it exceeds 50 knots, then there's, there's probably something wrong. Um, Aircraft will drop XBTs. Typically, we've seen them from the Gulf of Mexico. So those always exceed 50 knots. And uh, so you'll get a, a potential impossible speed errors when it's uh, an airdropped XBT. There's a little check in the uh, test that says if this has a particular call sign, which was of the aircrafts that were used to drop them, then uh, we would uh, change 
what the impossible, what the upper limit of the speed would be. With Argo floats, it's typically of the order of um, three meters per second is the three to five meters per second for a float is what you expect to see for those. And if it exceeds that, then you question whether the time or the location is wrong. And then the sounding is, again, just simply making sure if you're in the ocean and they give you a, a deepest depth in the profile or they actually have a sounding in that profile, that it actually lines up with what we know from a bathymetry file. And as I said yesterday, if we usually allow a 10% difference just simply because there are places where there are features in the ocean bottom that aren't captured in the uh, uh, digitized bathymetry file. And so you allow for that. And depending on where the station is, you may be in a very topographically varied location and you might allow, um, allow that sounding to be uh, kept in the file with a flag of oak of good if it's, uh, if it's in an area like that. So, I mean, these are all just very trivial, simple tests to do. It's surprising that anything actually fails them, but they do. It happens from time to time. I think, again, it's less likely these days because so much of the data capture is digital and, uh, and, uh, and therefore is, is usually more reliable. The, the location, the navigation of the ship is often hooked into the, uh, the data logger and so on. And so typically you, you do okay. Uh, but every now and then something fails and this test just makes sure that those very obvious errors don't leak through into your data file. Okay, so once that's done, as I say, then we run it through our duplicates checker and say, do, are, are there more than one station at, that look to be duplicates of each other? And if there are, we try to resolve whether they truly are a duplicate or whether they, um, they just look like they might be, but in fact they may be different. And, and in fact, what we do is if it's, unless we're absolutely sure it's a duplicate, we'll keep it. So it has to meet a fairly high, uh, a high standard, if you will, to, to be uh, eliminated as a duplicate. And at that stage, it truly is removed from further processing. So then we come to the suite of profile tests. And this is the suite that's involved. And... Uh, See, again, the, the figure on the, uh, on the right here, this shows a set of profiles. Uh, looks like an XBT drop, a series of XBT drops. Uh, the red line is a profile that's been flagged as having problems in it. Um, some of these other things would get flagged as well, but at this point, the red is as actually the profile where the focus of the QC is at that point. So it does profile by profile. Uh, the tests that we use in Canada plots temperature and salinity on the same, uh, same uh, presentation and then at the side it also has a, a plot of the density. So if we can see the density is increasing which is, which is what you expect to see. Um, so the first one, a very simple test. Are the salinities, are the temperatures and the salinities in the range, again, the very broad range you expect to see. So salinity from 0 to 41 PSU, we have, typically you'll see that at 40, sometimes lower than that. It depends where you operate. We saw some data from the far eastern uh, Mediterranean where the salinities exceeded 40 parts per thousand in the summer, late summer. So we had to change the limits because there were, they were failing the test, but they were, they were good profiles. Uh, water temperature, minus 2 to, minus to plus 40. Uh, again, minus 2 is uh, pretty uncommon. Uh, until last, last week, I thought that water would, the, the coldest temperature that seawater could get would be about minus 1.8. But I understand in the Antarctic, in fact, it can be a little colder than that. So we see occasionally minus 1.8 temperatures off the Grand Banks of uh, Canada, on the east coast of Canada. In the spring, 
you'll sometimes get very cold. So it's almost freezing. And what you do is, so, so that's the simple test. The upper limit of 40, again, that's kind of from what we know about global climatologies. Uh, places in the, um, um, the Red Sea, much warmer than that. And this, in fact, the salinities are much warmer. In the deep waters of the Red Sea, you get very high temperatures and very high salinities. An anomalous region, they'll, it'll fail these tests every time. We don't see that very often, at least not into the very deep waters, because the, the very deep waters in the Red Sea are, um, don't exchange very much with the, uh, with the rest of the oceans, and so they accumulate uh, temperature and salinity. So the next test, uh, again, this in, refines the global threat tests, and we have a couple in uh, the Mediterranean, one for the Mediterranean, one for the Red Sea. Um, so the Red Sea, for example, the temperature, the minimum temperature we expect to see is, well, 21.7. Uh, so if it's lower than that, you would wonder if it's uh, actually uh, a good reading. Again, these are all just flags that are set, but it allows uh, a technician, someone who's reviewing it, to actually look at it to verify that it looks it does indeed look wrong. You can add other areas if you like. Um, we just added those two, but if there are particular regions, I mean, you might say for the Baltic, you might want to add a, a, a different suite of uh, ranges just to tighten up the criteria that are sensible. You might do it for uh, uh, Sea of Okhotsk on the, uh, the east coast of uh, Russia uh, or the um, Yellow Sea, various areas around your coast that you know well and you can set sensible limits on. Increasing depth, this just says that if you're dropping an instrument or lowering an instrument, you expect it to always go down. You don't expect it to stop or actually go up. And occasionally that fails. When you're lowering a CTD, for example, sometimes you put it over the side of the ship, you just stick it in the water and let it what they call soak for a while, just to acclimatize to the water that there, and the ship's rolling around, the CTD will be bobbing up and down. And so occasionally you'll see these kinds of things. Normally that's removed from the profiles before we even see it at the data center. But occasionally you'll see a problem like this. Um, and sometimes it's not a problem. We had data coming from a CTD that was un mounted on uh, the uh, mouth of a fishing net. So they would tow, they would drop the net over the side of the ship and tow it, and it would go down, tow it along the bottom, and then come back up. And we were getting CTD records from that entire um, trace. So the ones coming up, of course, look like they're going in the wrong direction. It would fail this test. We know what's going on. It's not a failure. We would just reset those flags to, to uh, correspond to the reality that we understood. But normally you expect them to do from top to bottom. Uh, a global profile envelope. So this says that, um, yeah, this says that within the ocean you expect the surface layers to, to the values to be within a certain range. As you go deeper, the range of values on temperature and salinity get tighter. And so there's a set of values that say from 0 to 100 meters, you expect this kind of plus or minus value on the temperatures. Uh, as you go from, say, 100 to 500, there's another set of values and so on. So it's a little tighter um, um, check that the profile is behaving in a way that you expect. Uh, the values, I think, are actually in the QC manual, and you can see what they are. Constant profile. Occasionally, an instrument just fails, and you get all the same values at every depth. We saw that in one of the examples we were looking at yesterday. Basically, it's been a failure, and uh, doesn't happen all the time, but it does, and um, we reject those profiles. All the values are gone. Well, flagged. They're not gone from the data file, but they're all flagged. Freezing point test again. So this looks at it looks at the salinity at 
at every depth and uses the depth and the pressure to calculate what the freezing point would be, the temperature of freezing, and then compares it to the temperature at that depth. And if you compute that the freezing point at that depth as computed is warmer than a temperature that's been recorded, then you worry that it, there's something wrong with the temperature or the salinity. So again, just to check that there isn't an inconsistency in that, in the, uh, the temperature and salinity because of the freezing. Most places, this test doesn't matter, right? Most places in the ocean, you don't have those issues. But in the polar regions, it's uh, something to be, to be used. A spike test. This is a very, it looks a bit complicated, but in fact, it's a very simple test. It was invented in the 1960s. It was in the IGOS program. There was an IGOS manual that told a set of tests that you could use, and this was one of them. And it's a pretty simple test. It just looks for um, whether there's a large excursion from the points above and below. If the middle point has a large difference between those, it is considered to be a spike. And uh, so if it exceeds it by uh, 2 degrees C between the, top, the, the two adjacent points, or uh, one-third PSU, then it looks like it's a spike in the profile. A flag is set, and an operator has an opportunity to review and see if that uh, uh, truly is a, is a spike. Um, it works pretty well, actually. If you, it fails, of course, if you have two points that uh, constitute the spike. Yes? Yes? This one? Yeah. We use the, there's um, a SCORE manual. Uh, the SCORE is the Scientific Committee on Ocean Research. Um, and they have a manual of um, computations. And it uh, describes how to, do, how to do a distance calculation from a lats and longs, for example, how to convert uh, pressure to depth, and so on. And it has that test as well. The, the, how to calculate the freezing point. So I, uh, it's certainly referenced within the QC manual. Uh, top and bottom spike. What happens you sometimes uh, see, and particularly in XBT profiles, you'll see either the top, the very first point in a profile is sitting way off to one direction, often warm, or at the bottom you see a spike. And in fact, in the first little picture, let me go back to that. Yeah, there. Here, this is what bottom spikes look like, this sort of stuff. Clearly, it's a bad, bad data. So those are picked up and uh, automatically flagged to be reviewed. A gradient test, this just says that the um, the uh, gradient between two adjacent points doesn't exceed a certain threshold so that you don't get a very rapid change in either temperature or salinity or whatever the value you're looking for. We have threshold values for temperature and salinity. You can set them for other profile types as well. So if you know what a typical, uh, I don't know, fluorescence one or an oxygen spike might look like, uh, you would set something like that. Um, there's, as I say, these are developed, the, the thresholds are particular for TNS because that's what the project was about. But there's no reason why you can't extend to other thresholds for other profile types if, if you're handling them and you want to put it through a similar kind of graphical interface to help you uh, verify the data. And a density inversion. So you expect that the water underneath is heavier than the water above. Because if it isn't, if it's, it truly isn't, then it will mix. And so you don't expect to see those density inversions. Now you sometimes do see them in very high resolution CTD casts that are passing through those layers, but typically those data don't get to a data center. Uh, typically there are one meter averages or things like that, and you should not see a density inversion.
Again, this is just a test that the, the actual data hasn't gone through the bottom. <laughs> so XPTs, for example, are dropped. They fall to the bottom. The wire breaks. Uh, sometimes the wire doesn't break right away. So by the time of fall, the instrument, still, the recorder on board, thinks there's still wire being spooled out. It's still falling when, in fact, it's hit the bottom. And so you'll get measurements of depth that apparently go below the bottom. We just cu cut those off. And typically you'll see spikes and things like that at the bottom, but occasionally not. Okay, and then we look for uh, temperature inversions as well. And I remark that some of those are, are real, um, but many are not. And uh, we, we try to limit the size of the layer in which we see a temperature inversion because 50 meters, for example, is about right. Uh, for the uh, Mediterranean overflow, for example, it's typically within about 50 meter layer that you see that. Sometimes it's a little larger, but typically it's about that. So we just, these are kind of arbitrary numbers that we kind of pull out of the hat, if you will, based on some experience uh, that we see. You don't see, if you look in the World Ocean Atlas, you will not see this temperature inversion, I don't think, at depth, because it moves around, it changes with the seasons, and it gets averaged out when you do a climatological kind of calculation. But you should see it in some of the data in the World Ocean Database. You should see it, I guess it's off the, my geography is not so good, but it's south of the entrance to the Mediterranean, and as I say, around a thousand meters or so. So typically it doesn't happen, it shouldn't happen, but occasionally it does. Okay, so now we come to the climatology tests, and again, what we, you see here is a little example of what the screen looks like when it starts to look at, so you go through all the profiles, or you go through a profile, and depending how you implement it, Sometimes a climatology shows up at the same time you're looking at all of the results from the other tests, or you can plot it separately. And so what you see here is, uh, looks like an XPT profile, um, and the shaded, this is the Levitas climatology, and this is, I guess, um, three standard deviations from the mean, and the darker gray is five standard deviations. I, I presume that's what it is. That's typically what we do. And um, three standard deviations, that means 95% of the data should fall within the envelope, or you expect it to fall within the envelope. It doesn't mean it's wrong if it's outside. It means it's in 5% of the data, you will see values that fall outside. Five standard deviations is more like 1%, some whatever that is. Um, here you see the profile is, is uh, coming down well within the climatology, and then bang, you get a problem, okay? From this point, from this point here below, none of that data is real. It's all a failure mode typical of XBTs. Uh, what has happened is, at this point, I think this is a signature of what's called an insulation penetration problem. So... The copper wire, you know, that very fine copper wire had a fault in it. And as it spooled out, the, there was a short in the wire from the seawater. And that caused a spike in the temperature. And from that point on, you get electrical noise. You're not getting the actual temperature signal. So that's what, because the way its temperature is measured here is by a thermistor. So it's the resistance in the wire. And when you get a short, that changes what looks like the resistance, and that's why you get these peculiar uh, patterns. So all of that stuff, essentially you would say, all of this part of the profile gets flagged as good, so that's what this green bar means here. And from this point down, they're all marked as bad. That's what the red column means. So the, uh, you can use that to see if the data look like they have a sensible shape, for the area of the ocean, and of course with the Levitas monthly climatology, that's at one degree squares, five degree, something like that. And, um, 
and goes down to 3,000 meters, 3,500, somewhere like that. So sometimes you'll get profile from CTDs, for example, that go right to the bottom. So that'll be 4,000, 4,500, sometimes deeper than that. And uh, there'll be no climatology there because there's just not enough data. But uh, for the upper ocean, do you have pretty good statistics and uh, you expect, as I say, most of the data should lie within the three standard deviation envelope. These other tests, as I described, there are, there are other climatologies that existed at the time we wrote the manual. I guess we could probably add some more. Uh, I haven't been looking around for climatologies lately. But the one that's, that I think is, is probably the best one at the moment is this uh, monthly climatology that uh, has been built by Sid Levitas. And it's pretty commonly used. In the Argo program, they're actually building a climatology, regional climatologies based on Argo data with some of the um, CTD data that's been collected. That only covers, of course, from about 1990 to present, whereas SIDS climatology takes all the data he could find from whatever time it was they were measured. And some of the earliest records 1873 was one of the first expeditions of the, uh, the British ship Challenger. We have one station in the areas around Canada from the Challenger. But around the U.S. there's more. Around the, and across the Atlantic there are more. And they, um, they're represented in that climatology. They're pretty scarce, though. <laughs> um, so I won't go into too much, uh, but these other tests. But the seasonal t statistics, it's, uh, as I say, it's on um, uh, spring, summer, winter, and fall. So it's uh, three-month periods. It's not the uh, atmospheric spring, so it's not January to March. It's uh, been offset by what a, a spring looks like in the ocean, which is typically a, month, a couple of months later than it is in the atmosphere, or what we count as spring. Um, Emery and Dewar, a very old climatology, in fact. Um, same idea, though. It has statistics, and you usually, you typically use three standard deviations. Um, Asheville is just a sea surface temperature. The reason we use Asheville, though, for sea surface temperature is there are many more data from ships, um, just merchant vessels, part of the uh, volunteer observing ship program typically make SST measurements, often by uh, um, uh, water th uh, the water intake for the engines. They'll have a thermistor in there. And they report those at least, six, or at least uh, four times a day, sometimes um, eight times or 12 times a day. And they're, these are almost every merchant vessel has this kind, this kind of uh, measurement, reports it regularly. So the, in fact, there are many... I think of the VOS fleet and merchant ships over the course of the a month, there will be something on the order of a million measurements. And so there's much more statistics, if you will, many more data to use in calculating the sea surface temperature. And so you can use a combination of the Asheville climatology if you're just looking at sea surface temperature and say at the Levitus if you have a profile to look at. We talked about that. So we're now, we've come to what they call a waterfall test. And uh, so what you do is you take the, all of the stations that are collected by a single cruise, or at least a reasonable number of those if there aren't uh, too many, and you plot them sequentially. So each of these is plotted sequentially in time, where time goes this way, and depth, of course. And the temperature scale is offset for each profile, so that they are all plotted on the same uh, scale of temperature, of temperature versus depth, but there's an offset just to separate the profiles one from another so that you can see them. And the advantage of doing this is essentially you're looking for consistent features from one profile to the next. So, for example, here you see in this profile, you'll see a fairly uniform mixed layer down to oh, 100 meters or so. Um, 
And you see, and then a thermocline here, and then smaller features. Sometimes you'll see little wiggles down lower that represent other features. And you can see as the ship is progressing from the wherever it is, I guess this is the ship track here, um, you see that that mixed layer is gradually goes away and uh, you're moving into a different kind of water type where the, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have that strong mixed layer. So this is maybe closer to shore or shallower water. It may be just a different, um, it may be within an eddy, for example, and as you progress through, you're coming to a place where there, there isn't a strong mixed, uh, surface mixed layer. Here's that bad profile, really stands out. It's uh, the first part of it looks pretty consistent with the previous station and the station before it. But of course, where the instrument fails, it, um, it goes bad. Here's another profile that looks like it was stuck for the first, whatever, 50 meters or whatever it is, maybe 75 meters. And then sharp spike, cold spike, typical, typical signature. This thing is probably wrong. The first part of the temperature, it's in the range you expect. A little suspicious that it uh, looks so consistently the same, but you may well keep it. Again, the next profile, this is a peculiar looking profile. Um, this feature here is, is unusual and uh, there may be something to it, but uh, it looks wrong and it probably will get some sort of flagging from about this point here to probably just below. So this would look like a spike in the profile. Would get flagged as a four, uh, but the rest of the profile is probably kept. There's endless discussions between people who do QC as to whether you should do this or do that when you see such features. Endless discussions, mostly agreement, sometimes complete disagreement, but that's okay. That's okay. And then the next one. So, as I say, this is looking for consistency across the stations. So that's the waterfall that I showed you. And then, as I say, this is implemented in sort of two stages. The first does all the, the tracks. So this was a bigger picture of what I showed you in that first slide with the tracks. It looks like there are two or three different tracks on this, uh, on this representation. The speed of the vessel here, um, date and time, lats and longs listed here so that you can... And the, the interface gives you the ability to manipulate where you are move values around a little bit just to see if you can uh, account for some of the problems. It gives you some flexibility and of course sets flags. And then, right, and then you go to the uh, visual QC which you saw a few examples of what that looks like. Um, and we leave it up to, in fact, all of the profiles that come through Canada every profile that comes in in real time is looked at by an operator. And the software has been set up to be as efficient as possible so they can step through those profiles fairly efficiently and within an hour or so, a couple of hours, three times a week, you can do all of the data that's been received over the course of uh, since the last time. So it's a, actually a fairly efficient program and the intent was to put everything up on the screen that they need to know to be able to decide. Is the flagging that was set automatically, is that sensible or is it wrong? Is there one that's an error that's been missed that should get a flag? And you want to have all the information there so that people can make a decision and move on because there's lots of data coming in. So. This is, yes, quickly go through this. You've seen it already. QCP dollar records the tests that have been performed because, as I said, not all the tests of the manual are actually executed. And for a particular profile, for example, for a salinity profile, you won't exercise a temperature inversion test. So you should not set the flag that says, you should set a flag that says temperature inversion test on a salinity profile has not been act performed. And then if a test is failed, 
and, and the flag of 4 is preserved at that, then you should be sure that that is marked in the QCP. And so we talked about a bit, bit about that yesterday. This is what the flagging scheme, so this is test 1, test 2, test 3, test 4, test 5, and so on because of the way bits are ordered in computer uh, memory. Um, the number that's represented here is uh, 1023, and when you rewrite that as a hexadecimal, which is base 16, it comes out to 3FF, so it divides it in four, so the first four 1111 represents the number 15. In hexadecimal, that's F. The next four, 1111, F. And the first two, essentially 0011, that's the number 3 in binary. Or in, in hexadecimal as well. So that's, that's how this is set up. And as I say, it's done this way because we wanted to compress the space that we were using so that if we had lots of tests, we would have lots of room to add those. We have more room than we need at the moment. So, these little numbers here, as I said, those represent the numeric value. Uh, it's easier to think about it as just setting the flags uh, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, bit 4, bit 5, and so on. So, we're going to skip through these exercises for now because there's a little bit left. Yes. This Charles will exercise you on that. Yes. So this was when we when we um, was were developing these tests. We um, we decided that what we wanted was a very simple scheme to indicate to a user what our judgment was of the usability of the value. Not to tell uh, every test result for every level in the profile. We thought we just want a simple thing. Does this value look good? Does it look suspect? Is there something peculiar but we think it's okay? Is it wrong? Simple like that. So that when somebody's using the data they can say, I trust them. I just want to use the data that they have decided is good flag one. So I'll only go into the file and pull only those data with flag one. So that was the intent and not to load up more information at each level for the quality flag. So we made that choice. The Levitas Atlas, our quality, uh, World Ocean Database, in fact, has at every level, it has the set of flags of which tests were, um, were failed. Failed? Yeah. And uh, we decided that was not the way we wanted to go. Um, the flag scheme is like this. Uh, I think we saw it the other day. Charles said that we've added a flag 8 to represent that the value has been interpolated uh, because it's sometimes you would do that. So 0 means it wasn't tested at all. Uh, we, haven't looked at, we haven't looked at it. It's up to you to do it. 1 is in simple terms, one is good, two is probably good, three is probably bad, four it looks bad, five we've made a change. A nine, there is no there is no element there, and so the flag is set to nine, it's missing. These were adopted from uh, an old scheme from the 1960s. It was good enough. We didn't want to invent things that we didn't need to. And uh, so here's a comparison. This is what Argo basically started from the position that GTSPP had. They have pretty much the same use of the flags as they've had at this interpolated value, and that's what uh, we'll be adding shortly. The OS, OSDP, ODSBP. <laughs> they, they, <clears throat> it's a slightly different scheme, but it it maps this way. So these are showing kind of the mappings of the different things. And so you'll see ODV, which handles that. CDataNet has a, um, a similar, a very, uh, quite a similar one. Again, it was, I think, influenced by GTSPP. World Ocean Database has a different way of, of doing the flagging. <coughs> uh, 
and so it that's a hard one to do a straight mapping of, of flags software so you saw examples of what the software looks like at um, in the US the Canadian software is quite similar uh, the layout is a little bit different but the the uh, it's it's quite similar this is the Australian implementation they call it the MQuest system uh, it runs I think in MATLAB and uh, they're happy to give it to anyone who wants it. Uh, if you have a MATLAB license and uh, you want to learn how to use or to get this kind of software, you just have to talk to the Australians. Uh, I think, what, I don't know what yours runs in. Is it IDL? Uh, yeah. So I expect NODC would be happy to give you an, uh, the IDL software if you have a license for it. Um, you really don't have to buy the IDL license. Oh, uh, a runtime license. A runtime license, okay. Uh, the Canadian one was written in some old graphic software from the 1990s. You probably don't want it. <laughs> I think it's a Fortran program uh, that uses uh, plot calls to a particular library. Uh, you probably don't want it. Uh, there's more, more modern implementations. So anyway, this is what the Australian screen looks like. HEDA has pretty much the same capabilities as the other ones. Um, this is the cruise editor, so this is the way that one can, uh, again in the US NODC system, that allows you to manipulate uh, the cruise and try to figure out what's right and what's wrong with it. And uh, here's a comparison, a, a, a URL here to show uh, the comparison of MQuest QC with, uh, with the other software. Okay, so that's, I'll stop. I'll take you back to Charles. Charles, I ate into more of your time, but that's the way it goes. There you go. Okay, Oops. Um, I should ask if there are any questions, but talk to me at coffee if there are. Okay, I, I, I take the plan, you would ask, uh, all the typo because I, I make the slides so, so I take break and sometimes you know, even with the spare checker and you know, they didn't work pretty well so uh, so I take the break but anyway thank you for your eyes um, what I like to do for the next uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes I like to go through a very simple exercise with you with you and I'm not asking you to do this because the time limit so all the software we provide is in the course material package. So you are free to, to test when you return to your institution. Uh, the one more thing I'd like to add about the QC software. Right now, as Bob mentioned, that MQA is available for free from a CSIO, Australia. Okay. Uh, another package called the QC ED, QC Cruise Editor, is uh, written by Dr. Norm Hall at NLDC. We, we provide that free you know, as well. Um, so the, the software. QCED is available on the uh, uh, NLDC website. Uh, you don't have to buy the IDEO license. It's really exp expensive. But you do need a, a runtime license, which is free. You can download from. I don't know, because IDEO has been bought by so many, many companies. It's been transferred to other companies more than two times. I don't know. So, so I, right now, I cannot tell you uh, the URL on the top of my head, but you search Google, say IDL, and the probably you can find it. Okay, so, but you know, you, we, we have been giving uh, QCED to uh, one institution in Argentina, and we gave it to you know with Hawaii, and uh, it's easy, relatively easy to to install. We after they install, we have a free email exchange and down there on their own. So they can create their own regional commentology you know, for, for their purpose. So it's, it's not so bad, you know, it's, it's doing okay. Uh, so there's one fellow from India that she, she, she visited NLDC uh, last year and they do a comparison between MQuest and, and, and uh, QCED. Um, so I, I'd like to give you a kind of a lot. This is not a comparison, not try to see which one is better than which one. So that's, I don't want to give you know, your impression that we try to compare Q, uh, MQuest versus um, uh, QCED. It's just, just a choice, okay? So, so I'd like to go through some kind of exercise 
which we see you for now. So this, uh, as Bob mentioned, that GDPP using two, two level, the, the, the first one, first level, and the second level. Okay, uh, we should go another reverse again. The second level is called more details on each individual test. So right now we have twenty total of twenty six tests, but not all the tests are applied are used. So, so and 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 as Bob mentioned that. Look right here, that's a test number, and at the end, there's index number. So we add all the tests together, and come out with a very huge number. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's based on the, the, the number of the tests that's been performed. So the main ASCII is a very limited space, so we cannot hit that number. Some, sometimes I got you know, uh, 20 bytes or something, it's too, too long. So, you kind of convert it into hexadecimal, which is only up to eight position, which is very limited. So this is the way I'm going to show you how we come out with that number. But right now we only say oh, the only four tests are performed in this particular case. So the question is, what is the test number if the only the first four tests that are shown to the right panel will perform? So the answer is. You calculate the sum of the first four index numbers, which is the sum of one, two, four, eight, equal to fifteen. So that that's the decimal based on the decimal uh, system. Okay. Now you convert ten best number fifteen to a base sixteen, which has a decimal base. So that's a conversion, and you you, you can find that on the web to the, the, the conversion. So so fifteen in ten best will equal to f. In the sixteen the hexadecimal base, so you got sixteen, so the number is, is f. So you see f, and you can you should be able to reverse to figure out what's the test that's been performed. Okay, that's the, another way to do, one way to do. It. Okay, so the next question, this is just a kind of reverse. What is the test number? When all the six, six tests has been shown below has been calculated. So we have to write a R, this kind of test, writing R for you uh, to do. But right now, I'm not going to, to, use, to ask to do that. So, so that's giving you that the beauty for the R, you don't have to do actual you know, conversion. There's a, a format output called the uppercase O and the little case X percentage, and then followed by the uppercase X. That will automatically convert from your yeah, decimal number into hexadecimal. So so that's that beauty for the for the R. So so that that's the code. Looks like you sum together one, two, three, four, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sum together and and the convert that sum, which is which is the total for these six numbers, and using this format as output. And they come out zero x three four. Okay. Okay, so 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 that's the hence exercise uh, nine nine two. All the code are in the course material package, so uh, it's also available. The actually the next thing I like to show you is the okay. This is this is uh, uh, maybe we can do it on a uh, online test demo right here. Okay, now. So that gave you a feeling, say how powerful of the R look like. So right now I'm logging to my account, this machine over there, and you using my real account, the C sign account on that machine. Okay, so I'm going to my G training. G training code, and that should be another program called Samsung Night. I like to make sure that the source code is there. Nine dash two something. No? Okay, two something. Uh. Okay, it's not there, but I can copy over. I can copy. From this account, mm, I don't know. Can I 
h to a here we are okay so so I just copy over from my my personal account so so to run r in a batch mode, you don't have to go to R environment. So it's, all you have to do is just say R script. OK. So this is kind of reverse. I'd like to know if the text number is 63, so, so what's, the, what's the total, uh, what's the actual number? R script to GTSPP EX9 2A dot R. So, so this this script, this R script read the command variable from the command line. So I'm end earned sixty three. So I come up with zero, small x three f. Okay. So we can take a look under this source code how it looks like. Is it? So the first line tell the system reading a command from the com reading a variable from command line, and the second one just reading that number which is here arcs, and using the uh, R format upper format, and it will come out with the hexadecimal number right here. So so it's it's easy. Okay. So let's go to. Uh, Another, another thing I'd like to pass to you is how to interpret the output, the QC result. Okay, which is more important for you. Let's move to Okay, uh, okay. This is a, let's try another, another case. Hence, interpret QC test in R. So once you have test to see test output result, let, let's try this one. I'm not sure if I have this one here. Okay, it's not there. Okay, let me copy over. Copy, it's got to be three. Three, sure. Okay, so, so I just follow instruction here and they actually they take actual look on these files. Nine test three dot R. Okay, it's not a very long file, it's only of uh, uh, six or seven lines. Okay. So you enter the text code or result, and this is the way we, we try to interpret the QC test. Okay, the way we did it right now. So right now, you will see this is the test, this is the test code or test result. Okay, the number right here. Okay, they say you see something that in, in the in the uh, GTPP main ASCII file on SCDF code, you see this kind of text result. You know, this is either text result or text code. They look very similar. So I like to interpret. In this case, I got this number from the I made, uh, one of the main ASCII file. So I say R S C R R I P T R script and the, 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 the code, the name of the source code, G T S P P exercise E X three ex nine this three dot bracket r and I know the test code or test result is this one. It look like a, this is a, a te test. This is a return from your test zero zero two one seven three five and uppercase E. Okay. So so you got this number. Okay, so so there, there's a 
And if you to, this will tell you what test has been performed. And this is reverse, because as Bob mentioned to you, the computer is coming from right, output is from right to left. So when you try to interpret it, we, we reverse. The, the program reverse the, the binary, the sequence of binary number from left to left to right. So when you see the first test zero, that means the first test is not performed. One is yes, so and so forth, so forth. Okay, so if you have to look into uh, 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 GTPB data user menu to, to know what, sometimes I forgot what, what's, the, what's the meaning for the each number. Okay, so this is one way to interpret QC test in R. Another method is using uh, more, more fancy one. It's called interpret QC per. That's another per program allow you to do that. Let me see. Is in my yeah here here in interpret QC dot peer. Okay, you can. So the first thing to do, you ever run this before, and the first thing you have to do, you have to look at the uh, menu menu. So, so you have to do is interpret it. QC dot PL, and you always say dash help for help. So it gives you a bunch of options that allow you to do that. So we can do repeat. Okay, I have to. No, okay, how to do that? Okay. Okay. So, so this is the exercise nine four. We like to use an interpret QC dot per. Say so use QNF equal to this number. So how many QC tests were failed in the test and what what they are? Okay. So the answer to that is we use an interpret QC to interpret QNF, which per which the QC uh, performed by NODC. The QC something is performed by Canada. Okay, so you, the output of the QC interpret per will look like this one. Okay, and I show you how it looks like. So what you have to do is you just say I N T E R P R E T Q C dot per and enter. Uh, Enter, enter this number. Oh, gee, this number. Okay. I said this is uh, this is a test of what? No, it's a decode. It's a result. It's a it's a test result, as I can tell. So so you, you should say this, the number is is a test result. So you have to say dash result. Okay, and followed by one, two, three, four, one, zero, 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 right? Okay. Oh, I need to specify the output. Dash O. Well, now I just say it's too small for me to see. Just say test out. Okay, now you can look. We can look at test out. Should be similar to what you see on the screen. This one, and this is a much reorient the output in a more, more, more readable way. So you know the first one with test number. Okay, is zero one to I said up to right now it's up to thirty two, but we are not using all of them. Okay, because the way we set up. So this is a, this is because this is the test. This is a test result. So you are looking at uh, this is the, the first test platform identification. It looks like a, you know with uh, this is zero means passed. 
and, and the F one means failed. So this means, okay, the only failed is this one. See, there is just no statistics. Okay. Yeah. So this is a simple example uh, how to run the interpret QC uh, to understand what's the test result. So you can use an interpret QC dot perl either for test to look at the test result or to or to look at what the what kind of test has been used. Okay. So so it's a southwest layer for you to use, and you can practice later on during the break. And I say this is a, what I would like to tell you so far about all this cover this. Uh, and I make a typo over there. Oh, sorry. Okay, so that's just the the you know, uh, the exercise. Uh, you you can lock on in, onto your uh, Linux account and just play around a little bit. You no, know, either during lunch time or whatever you like to do. Okay. Uh, any, any question for me or for Bob again? Okay. So prepare for the presentation because this morning's talk. Will be you need to give us a briefing on what you learned this morning, particularly on the QC break system. Okay. Okay. So now we should stop here for break and maybe. Bake.